Um, so this is kind of a kind of an interesting, momentous like move that we're doing with the center. Thirteen years ago, uh, Phil Weiser often tells the story of the intrepid uh, law students who came to him and said, "I want to start a journal." Uh, and Phil Weiser said, "Do we need another tech journal?" And they went back and forth. Um, and he was convinced that he needed a tech journal here at Colorado. Um, and, and we did. We founded something called the Journal on Telecommunications and High Technology Law. Uh, and it's really become a bellwether for debates not only in privacy but in telecommunications. Uh, many of you probably know that the term net neutrality, which has been in the news this week, uh, was first coined at this conference at Silicon Flatirons. And the first 10 articles that were interesting about net neutrality, eight of them appeared in the pages of our journal. Um, and so. Our journal is something that we take great pride in. This conference feeds the journal, as you've heard. Um, but the one thing that's always bugged me a little, and Phil's not in the room, right? So it's not the greatest name in the world, right? The Journal on Telecommunications and High Technology Law. There's a Journal on High Technology Law. I thought about sending them a trademark cease and desist, and then I thought, that's not friendly. It's a mouthful. Is it on or is it of? Um, and so at any rate, the biggest problem I've always had with it is it didn't embrace who we are and what we think we've built here. It was very anonymous. Uh, and so we've decided, starting with this conference and the issues that are being submitted for this journal, uh, that we're renaming our journal to be the Colorado Technology Law Journal. Um, and it's partly just catchier. Hopefully, you'll learn to run with it. And frankly, it's partly our like planting the flag in the ground, saying, this is what we do. Uh, we have this center here. We're very proud of it. Uh, and we want you to associate things with our brand. Um, and so these fine um, editors and authors who are writing and joining us today, they will be in the flagship very first issue of the Colorado Technology Law Journal. Um, and so look for that. right? And if you don't subscribe now, you should. It's probably pretty cheap. Um, and frankly, we don't make much money on it anyway. Um, but I did want to highlight that and take the moment. But I'm now joined by Julie Brill. Let me move over here. Do you have your microphone on? Excellent. Yes, can you guys hear us both OK? It's a little cooler. I'm glad about that, too. Um, so it's really my pleasure um, to join Julie Brill once again up here. Um, I, I, when I invited Julie this year, I said, you are part of my house band, um, because you, you always come and say something so deep and insightful, and you help kind of ground the conversation. Uh -oh. now, <laughs> now, this year, we did something supposedly innovative, uh, which we invited David Medine, who is on, who's the head of the President's Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which got a shout out uh, during the speech. Not only did he get a shout out, but the president asked him to be in the audience for the speech. Uh, and he hemmed and hawed. He thought, who's more important in my life, the president <laughs> or Colorado? Um, but, he, but he politely and very graciously declined. I actually pulled up a chair in his honor. So there's David Medine's chair. Um, but, it, but it really is a thrill. And so let me just uh, spend a minute trying to embarrass you as best as I can. Uh -oh. Um, the last time I introduced Julie Brill, we were kind of passing acquaintances. Um, but since then, I've had the wonderful, wonderful opportunity, uh, in many ways, kind of like, like a cornerstone of my career, uh, to spend a year at this agency. Um, I gave a speech about the FTC shortly after leaving. Christopher Yu, a friend who was in the audience, came up to me at the end and said, you're really in the tank for the FTC. And it's true. I'm a fan. It's a, it's a rare government agency where there's this shared sense of mission where people are defending consumers. That's what they eat, drink, and breathe. Um, and it's just a place where you don't feel like people are biding their time until they can get the big offer uh, from the big firm. And I think a large part of that comes from the top and from people like Julie Brill, who is a lifetime civil servant who has been dedicated to antitrust and consumer protection uh, issues in attorney general's offices, uh, and now as a commissioner of the FTC. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very, very well-functioning place, and it's a happy place. And I attribute that all to people like you, Julie. So it really is a personal privilege as well as a professional privilege uh, to share the stage with you. Oh, that's so. really sweet. Thank you. Well, sure. um, we also, I'm, I'm not sure this is, can you guys hear me OK? No. Do you, uh, you want to flip the switch, maybe? Or? I, I was told it's going to be, I don't have to flip the switch. Oh, OK. You know what? Should I, is it on now? It's not on. Here, right. look for the I light. Do you have the light? It. Yeah. <laughs> let's see. Yeah, let's. OK, they told me I didn't have to do it, but now I'm <laughs> All right. How's that? That must be much better. OK, Yay. sorry about that. Well, thank you, Paul, for those wonderfully kind words. The truth of the matter is you're fabulous, too. And we loved every minute of having Paul um, and miss him dearly every single day. Um, 
So yeah, we're we it, we're a really interesting agency. I mean, there are people there who really care deeply about consumer protection issues, and um, I I before I had gone there was sort of wondering how committed it was compared to state AG's offices and other local uh, consumer protection law enforcers, and it is every bit, if not more, committed. It really is. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. So so let's dig into this. We've got about half an hour together, and again, we want uh, to hear a lot of your questions, including from you students. Um, the, the talk I started to do at the very beginning before I was rudely interrupted by the president, um, kind of tried to, tried to pose a, a, a dichotomy uh, between really abstract harms, new harms, harms that are difficult to define, uh, and very, very concrete harms. Uh, and I think I want to ask you the same question in, uh, in two versions. One is about you personally, and one is about the agency right. you're representing today. So, so for you personally, what do you think about the kind of way we prioritize and trade off those two types of harms? Like, which, which should we care more about? Which has more salience? Which more, is more important? Is it an either or, or is it both? I mean, right. Well, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I think it's so important for me to engage with the academic community, and not just here, but as anywhere I actually can, um, is to really get my my grounding in what it means what harm means. I mean, I think it is an incredibly important question. It's one of the questions that we need to answer at the Federal Trade Commission because it's part of the element of, of, of some of the cases that we bring. When we are claiming that a privacy practice has been unfair, one of the elements is, well, has it caused substantial harm? Um, I think that what I mean, what I think of as an abstract harm, probably to some of the scholars here, is not so abstract. Right? So some of it is in defining terms. When I think of concrete harms, I think some of the scholars here may say, well, that's obvious. It's not even concrete. It's just like so clear. So, you know, in, when we're operating under the Federal Trade Commission Act, or frankly, when state AGs are operating under their mini FTC acts, to the extent that they have a harm element, or we clearly do have a harm element, you know, the concrete harms that people tend to think about are obviously financial. Identity theft has been kind of well accepted, um, or the potential for identity theft has been well accepted as a potential harm. Um, but, but I think that if you take a look at our cases over the past several years, the line between abstract and concrete, I think, has been uh, blurring. I think that there are harms that I clearly have thought were um, concrete enough to bring action under the Federal Trade Commission Act, but um, perhaps others might not have thought that to be the case, say, 20 years ago. So, for instance, um, uh, uh, disclosure of health information, you know, when um, either through a security breach or otherwise. I mean, health information doesn't lead to the same type of financial harm that um, uh, disclosure of other, like, credit card information can lead to. But still, disclosure of health information in some of our cases we brought as um, an unfair act because it's considered to be highly sensitive information. I think of that perhaps as sort of bridging that notion of concrete to abstract. Um, and we've done other cases. I mean, and we so we can so me personally, um, I think it's a very important conversation to have. It's something important to think about. But probably. I think of um, some of the things that, that I would say are abstract. You right. and your colleagues might say, no, 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 that's pretty concrete. No, that's an important reminder. And, and then some of the things we might call abstract, you might think, yeah, we're not there yet. Right? I, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. We, meaning even I may not right. be there. Right. Right. In other words, I might be worried about it, but I might have trouble thinking of how to yeah. fashion a case under the Federal Trade Commission Act. So, so then let me, uh, you, you talked about, and, and again, for the students, and I apologize for those of you who are FTC wonks through and through, so Section 5 is a large part of the grant of the authority of the agency, and it's got these two tiny words, right, deceptive and unfair. Right. Right. Um, and, and I think what we're largely talking about is unfairness when we talk about harm. Um, and so the, the question that often gets asked is, uh, there's a statement from 1980 that says, harm doesn't have to be monetary harm. Right. But, but what are the, our guiding lights when we're talking about non-monetary harm under unfairness? James Cooper on the last panel invoked the designerware laptop spying case. Yep. Um, that seems really, really harmful and unfair. Is that an easy case, a hard case? Like, what, what can you say about non-monetary harm? Well, we, we have brought cases that involve non-monetary harm. I mean, designer wear, again, was that case where um, rental 
uh, uh, companies, companies that are like rent-a-center type of places, it wasn't rent-a-center, but that were renting computers and laptops to consumers, had built-in security devices where they could turn the, the camera the built-in webcam onto the consumers and, and watch what they were doing in their homes. No monetary harm there, but a deep invasion of personal space and, pri and privacy. And um, we did, we did, we were very specific in the complaint and very specific in the aid to public comment about what happened in that case. Um, but it was clearly non-monetary harm. It was clearly a statement by the commission that um, this invasion of personal space and, and essentially spying on consumers unbeknownst to them or, or not reasonably known to them was, was problematic. But, you know, we've done other things in the unfairness space. Um, one of the counts against Facebook when we did our um, big case involving Facebook was that they had engaged in material retroactive changes of their privacy policy and that we thought that was unfair because consumers really, there wasn't anything that they could do about it. It was retroactive. Uh, the company said, okay, from, from now on, all that information you gave us in the past, we're going to treat it this way rather than that way that we told you we were going to treat it. We thought that that was unfair. Um, in uh, There was a case we did involving a social network app called Path. Uh, some of you may remember that case where um, the app was downloading consumers' contact lists, their smartphone contact list, without adequate information to consumers. Again, no monetary harm, but we deemed it a, an invasion and uh, inappropriate use of consumers' information, collection and use of consumers' information without, without letting them know about it. Finally, another interesting case um, might have been a little bit before your time, uh, which, you know, was, but it wasn't, but I was there, so it wasn't that long ago, was um, Frostwire, which was uh, a, a P2P, um, a, 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 a P, yeah, P2P app sharing uh, uh, program where um, what was happening was consumers and wanted to share a certain amount of information, but the app instead took a whole bunch more information from consumers and made it very difficult for the consumers to unshare information that was um, uh, on their smartphone. So these are cases that, you know, again, it's not monetary harm. Um, and I think, you know, we've made statements in these cases, I believe we've made statements in these cases that these are the kinds of things that still represent harm even though they're not monetizable. Now, there are other cases we've done where we have not brought unfairness counts because um, they clearly uh, fell into a deception category. And I actually kind of would have preferred to see unfairness as well as deception. I mean, um, there's, there have been cases where um, health information, there were, were breaches of uh, uh, health information where statements had been made to consumers that their information would, would be kept very, very safe, and it wasn't. And so we brought those as, we pled those as uh, deception. But, you know, we could have done it as unfairness. So it's, 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 it's never quite as bright a line as um, Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly like. found it a fascinating part of my year there was to, there, there are different opinions, I think it's fair to say, even yes. within the building about what unfairness means, what harm means, um, and so it's, it's really great. Uh, I, I imagine there might be questions from the audience on that. Let me take a crazy left turn for a second, and then sure. we'll come back. Sure. Um, this is the question you would have said, oh, that's for David Medine, but he's not here, so I'm going to ask you. So, so one thing that struck me over the last couple of months um, is the fact that you've actually mentioned Edward Snowden by name in a couple of speeches. Yep. Um, and then you're always quick to say, this, this is not what we do. It's not my job responsibility. Uh, but it's a moment to talk about privacy in the corporate sphere as well. Absolutely. And I want to know what you mean by that. Like, I want sure. to give you another chance to say more about sure, that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I've spoken, in, uh, I've, I've spoken about that in speeches. I've written some articles about it. I mean, look, I've been doing privacy and uh, data security work for over 20 years. I led the state's privacy working group um, for many, many years, helped the state's uh, work on and design their data breach notification laws. Um, I've got a deep, deep background in privacy, and I don't think I've experienced um, such heightened awareness of privacy issues ever before in my life as I have in the last four or five months. Now, it is true that, you know, the Snowden revelations are largely focused on uh, government surveillance, and we've had a wonderful panel on that. We watched the president speak about that, largely speaking about that. It's not what the Federal Trade Commission does. We focus on commercial privacy and commercial data security. But I think that this moment that has been created as a result of um, the heightened awareness uh, that, that we now have about uh, government surveillance, I think 
has raised the um, profile of privacy generally and has given us an opportunity as a society to be thinking harder about these questions and thinking harder about what are the appropriate ways in which data should be collected across um, the ecosystem, not just with respect to government, but also with respect to companies. The president said that in May, right before I gave a, a, another speech about this and right before I wrote about it in the Washington Post. And frankly, he said it again today. Right? He said that you know part of this is thinking about big data and big data analytics, both in the commercial and government sphere. So um, to me, it's, it's a moment. It's, you know, sometimes we call these teachable moments, but really I think of it as a moment for action to be thinking about how can we improve privacy, especially um, uh, from my perspective, because it's what I do, in the commercial sphere uh, with respect to giving consumers more information, more transparency, and more control over the way their information is collected. Okay, that's great. So, so the way, where I want to turn to you now, and again, I, I really do want to get to your questions. I have like a list of like nine specific types of cases we can talk about, but, but let me try and kind of ease my way into them. So, so one thing that happened when I was in uh, D.C., and, I, and I'll confess, like there are some people who don't love the FTC as much as I do. They love the FTC, but they're a little more critical of some of its actions. Um, and one thing, and again, this might be a little academic, but just bear with me. So you heard people, I heard a lot of people during the year criticize what they called the soft law of the FTC. Um, and I think, if I can channel the, the critique, the idea is sometimes the FTC enforces a case and there's a consent decree and a press release. And sure, there are critics about that practice as well, but at least we understand what's going on. Sometimes the FTC will hold a workshop and then re uh, release a report and take public comment. And these reports are loftier and a bit more academic and a bit more ambitious in their kind of scope. And people basically begin to conflate the two. And they say, you know, when you talk about all of the fears of big data in this report, we think you're going to go after companies for some of the things you're worried about here. And moreover, we don't think that's appropriate. We think, and so, so the question is almost like an academic, like higher level question. Is that a fair critique? Like, should you get out of the game of writing workshops, reports altogether? Should you write them differently? Are you, are you muddying the waters by trying to do this while you're also trying to enforce? So I could answer that really quickly and say, no, we're not, and, and we could move on. But, but um, it probably is worth... <laughs> <laughs> and moving on now, yeah. But, it, but seriously, I mean, we, the Federal Trade Commission was designed by Louis Brandeis, for those of you who don't know this, and it's actually our 100th anniversary this year, so we're a very old institution. But we were designed to be not just your typical law enforcement agency. We do do law enforcement first and foremost. But we were also designed to do studies and to be able to dive deep into issues. Um, and that power is actually written into our statute as well. So, I, but, the, but as I best understand, there's two prongs to the criticism as best I understand it, and maybe others will ask questions about this later. One is the notion that uh, consent decrees mean anything um, since they haven't been uh, decided upon, uh, typically speaking, um, by you know a, a third party neutral judge. So that's one aspect that you can't really create a body of common law um, through consent decrees. The other criticism is, is where you kind of wound up, which is that our reports, like our 2012 privacy report, which was designed to set out best practices for companies, or our mobile app disclosure report, or our dot com report. I mean, we've got so many reports in this space. Um, but all of that is, is setting out, we, we say clearly what we're doing is setting out best practices, but do we really have a secret agenda, right? right? So, um, let me address both fairly quickly. And, and Woody, your piece with Dan is about the first issue, right? So Woody, Woody wrote a great piece with Dan Solov about um, the FTC's uh, body of um, consent decrees and, and whether or not this does amount to um, common law. And obviously, it doesn't, it's not tr any form of a traditional common law because it's not judge-determined law. But what the attribute, in my view, so I'm no longer quoting you because I don't remember exactly all that you guys said, but in my view, what it does do is it gives guidance to companies. And that is one of the important attributes of common law. So maybe you want to call it common law light, maybe you want to call it something else, but there's no question but that there is a bar of private lawyers um, as well as law enforcers in, in other places, whether they're uh, local or state, who look very closely at FTC orders 
as well as our adjudicated cases to see what it is that we were concerned about. What were the, fa what were the facts at issue in those cases? So it may not be common law in any like real sense of the word, but it does provide some level of guidance. And that leads to the second issue, which is when we, when we write these reports, we try to be absolutely as clear as we can that these are best practices. What we're trying to do is give guidance to industry. Frankly, for those of you who may not know me or haven't seen me before, um, you could ask others in the audience who know me pretty well. I speak a lot, and I go around and talk to business and the business community a lot, and I do it in small, quiet groups, and I do it in big fora. And one of the reasons is because they really want to hear what it is that the FTC is thinking. I think that the reports that we do are an instrumental, critical part of our work to inform not, not only consumers, but the business community about the kinds of things that they might want to be thinking about if they want to engage in best practices. And I hear over and over from companies, you know, we understand what, it's, what it means to violate the law, what it would mean to be deceptive, or what unfairness means, but what should we do? You, you know, leaving aside that you might take action against us, you know, where do we, go, how do we give disclosures? on smartphones where there's no real estate? How do we effectively deal with hyperlinks? I mean, this is just one example that we address in the mobile app disclosure report. So I think um, the confusion around the difference between our reports and our cases um, is, is, mis is somewhat misplaced. I understand the concern, but I don't think it ought to be there. And um, I don't think that our reports are necessarily giving anybody a guide to our next enforcement action or an enforcement action two or three years down the road. They, they really are designed to be best practices. Okay, so, so lightning round because we I, okay, we're okay, okay, question okay. and answer. But, okay. So I'm going to ask the same question Scott Peppet asked, okay. you know, the, the big, like, big, big fear. Like, what's the one practice that you see on the horizon or maybe here now that keeps you up at night, right, that, about okay. privacy in particular? Yeah. How long do I have to? Yeah, have exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning round, right? All right. I, I do worry about the very rich profiles that are being created by um, entities, data brokers, uh, and other analytics firms that um, consumers don't know exist. They don't know how to access those companies. They don't know even where to begin to go to find out uh, where these rich profiles are or what is in them. I also am worried. And, and I worry that some of those profiles really have sensitive information in them, like health conditions, uh, race, income, uh, coded language for sexual orientation and other, and, and other categories. Um, and then I worry about, and that, that is all information that was collected offline and combined with online information through tracking or other, other means. But now we're moving into the world of the Internet of Things, connected devices. And uh, the amount of information that will be available about how we interact with the, the real world, what's happening to our bodies with medical devices or Fitbits or other devices that um, ha will have very rich information about our, our bodies. Um, you know, all of this information could start to be combined into profiles that will just uh, really, that, that, that we won't be able, you and I might not even be able to fathom what would be in them, let alone your average consumer who doesn't have any idea that this practice is going on. So those are the things I worry about and what I really, um, and, and I worry that like in, on, in the Internet of Things, you know, consumers are going to start having devices, whether it's their car or some, or some other tool that they have that's connected and sending information to a number of different entities and the consumer might not even realize they have a connected device. Right. Or that the that the, the thing that they're using is collecting information about them. I mean, so we we're in a, a a world that I think challenges to a great degree concepts around notice and choice. I mean, how do you give notice and choice to a consumer on a device that doesn't have an interface, but it's collecting information? You know, how do you do this? I've I've have some ideas about it. It's something that we're thinking about um, at the FTC. We just had a workshop on the Internet of Things. But the real fear, to go back to your question, is. All of this information will become part, I believe, of, or could become part of very rich profiles. And the questions are, you know, what will consumers, if anything, be able to do about it? What kind of control will they have over it? Yeah, and I think in your recent TrendNet case, there was also the question of how do you fix things once they're broken and deployed? And that seems like it'll be difficult when you have something with a little bit of RAM or ROM, even worse, sitting out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so then I, I want to ask one last question. And so of the nine different types of cases you bring, 
I think the one that's been most discussed lately is, is the data security cases. Right. Right, and I know that there's a lot of like active things swirling around in litigation. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you uh, specifically about a case, but again, in DC, one of the arguments I heard a lot was uh, the harm point that there's right. no harm. And in fact, someone today said this, right? Your credit card is only going to charge you fifty dollars, and in the case of some breaches, nothing at all. They'll just decide to let you off the hook, um, and and that everything else that may be considered harm is just too squishy and non-monetary. To count. So, so what's your response to that? I mean, I'm guessing you don't agree with that critique. I don't. I don't agree with that. I mean, I think everything, every case is is specific to the facts of the case. And so, but having done data security cases for many, many years, um, you know, what one thing that I've learned over time is, despite the fact that um, Brian Krebs was able to figure out very quickly online that many that there were many lists of target. Um, customers available immediately for sale. Um, this is Krebs security. Um, sometimes with data breaches, um, there is a very long tail with how, long, how uh, far out that information may still be available and when it could result in some kind of identity theft. Um, it is true. I mean, the banks and the credit card companies are very good about giving consumers, you know, saying if, if this was, is a fraudulent charge on your card, you know, you're not going to be responsible for it. But what do you do if someone, I think Julia Angwin was using the word not um, takes your identity but impersonates you, opens up new cards, open up, opens up new accounts. It is, if you ever talk to anyone who's been through the problem of having their identity stolen and used in this way, it is incredibly cumbersome to, and, and troubling to have to deal with. I mean, it can affect your job, it affects your credit score, um, it, it, it can affect you in so many ways that 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 is in many ways the crux of the harm around identity, uh, around a data breach, is that it can lead to very, very um, troubling uh, uh, um, things that a consumer has to face, not just in a monetary way, but lots of time and lots of trouble. But in addition, I mean, for those of you who might have shopped at Targets or Neiman Marcus during the time period that was at issue, you'll know something that I've been hearing a lot from consumers as I go around the country. People are worried. You know, even though they know that their credit card company, you know, will pay them back, you know, do they really have to monitor every one of their accounts now for a year? And what happens after a year? And the credit monitoring is no longer offered. I mean, these, the anxiety that comes about as a result of data, um, data breaches, I think is also, um, uh, real and something that we need to, we need to address, uh, when we're thinking about, when we're thinking about potential harms. Excellent. Okay. And there's the bell. So, um, oh, is that what that is? No, no, no. That was someone's telephone. <laughs> um, so we're going to invoke the wiser rule again. So the first question shall go to a student, volunteering or otherwise. Thank you, Michael, in the back. Yeah, wait for the microphone, please. <clears throat> uh, we talked a lot about the harms that are caused by the data breaches. Should companies be held accountable when? They're following all the rules and they're doing everything right, and they still get hit. So my question is: Should we have better safe harbors for companies? It seems as though we all benefit from the ability to use our credit cards. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, was everybody able to hear that? He did have the mic. Okay. No. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, so I was. I actually just um, was at uh, a, a retail a group of um, retailers general counsel summit, and they. I was asked the same question. You know. After the target breach. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. This was just a couple of days ago, and they asked the same question. You know, w w are, is this a gotcha game? If you suffer from a breach, does it mean that you're going to face FTC action? And isn't aren't you really victimizing? Aren't you really going after the victim? And I want to be really clear. You know what we focus on. When when we bring a case, this is not the criminal authorities. The criminal authorities are trying to figure out who, who were the hackers, who is the, what's the criminal ring, and what are they doing with the consumer's data that they've now stolen or obtained. Um, we are looking at the company's practices to determine whether or not they had reasonable security. And we look at security data security, it's a very flexible concept. And it's designed, we, we look at things like the size of the company, the nature of the information that they had, um, you know, what were the practices and procedures they had in place, what is kind of considered to be, you know, good security um, by the community that they are working in, that, that, that they are a part of. We do not go after cases that are, um, 
oh, you failed to have the very latest bit of security. You failed to, like, make the very la last patch that just came out a week before, um, uh, you know, the, the breach. What we're looking at are cases where, um, it, even, you know, reasonable security that is accepted in the community as being reasonable has not been complied with. Another thing people often ask me is, well, do, does every company that faces a breach wind up as, um, you know, under an order with the FTC. And that's absolutely not the case. I mean, there are data breaches we investigate and we look at and we see did the, did the company have reasonable security under the kind of flexible standard that I just talked about? And if the answer is yes, you know, we will, we will close the case. So, um, yes, of course, credit cards benefit all of us, and of course, um, uh, you know the f the free flow of of monetary information and all and other kinds of information is a huge benefit. But we do want to make sure that when companies have sensitive information, whether it's credit card, health information, or other kinds of information that is sensitive, that they have reasonable security to protect that information, and that's what our cases focus in on. Another question? Yeah, over here. Well, so back to the credit card. Microphone. Card. Microphone. Card. Uh, yeah, so I was in the ITF like two decades ago when we were saying, gosh, this idea of credit cards online is such a stupid idea. You're going to give your credentials to someone who can now buy stuff on your behalf, even though it's a company you're trusting. When are we going to get rid of credit cards and have a system that uses decades-old technology to protect both the consumer and the company and allow transactions to happen without putting either of them at risk? Um, so there, so uh, I um, don't disagree with you. I mean, I travel in Europe, as do many of you, I'm sure, and I try to give my credit card to European taxi drivers. They have no idea what to do with it because it's not the pin and chip technology that um, exists in in many other countries. Um, I think it is time that we um, employ or deploy. Uh, uh, reasonable technology that's been around for a long time um, in our credit cards to make them more secure. And, um, you know, pin and chip technology seems to be appropriate. I know that the um, banking community has talked about implementing that by 2015. That feels like it's a long way away to me. But it's also the, the deployment of the technology is expensive. I mean, it, you know, there are a lot of people who will have to um, uh, invest in readers um, and, you know, we want to make sure that if they're going to make the investment that it's going to be a, a meaningful and lasting one. So there are issues that need to be faced in this area, but I do think it's time for the U.S. to um, become a, a first world country when it comes to the credit cards. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, Chris Segoyan. Well, he's practically, I mean, he's, well, no, I'm teasing. Go ahead. <laughs> so, Commissioner Brill, thank you for being here. Um, the FTC largely stays away from issues of, of government surveillance, and I understand that's for both sort of statutory and political reasons. But one of the things we've learned in the last eight months or so is that several U.S. companies have intentionally weakened the security of their products, continue to advertise those products as secure when, in fact, they've been weakened. Um, insofar as companies have deceived consumers by saying their products were secure when they voluntarily weakened them or even got paid to weaken them, uh, and insofar as there may even be harm there because those products are then uh, more vulnerable to cybersecurity uh, related attacks, will the FTC st still s steer clear? But do you think you have the authority to go, over, to go after companies that intentionally weaken their products and deceive consumers by doing so? I'm going to pass. Yeah. <laughs> We'll talk about that offline over beers tonight. Um, so uh, so uh, I, I do want to keep us on. We, we could go on for, for a long, long, long time. There are a lot of questions. So hopefully you're around. Oh, absolutely. I am, I am around this afternoon. Um, but please join me in thanking Julie Brill. Thank you.